Apple Card is the credit card created by Apple. You earn 3% daily cash back up front when you use it to buy a new iPhone 15, AirPods, or any products at Apple. And you can automatically grow your daily cash at 4.15% annual percentage yield when you open a high-yield savings account. Apply for Apple Card in the Wallet app on iPhone. Apple Card subject to credit approval. Savings is available to Apple Card owners subject to eligibility. Savings accounts by Goldman Sachs Bank USA member FDIC. Terms apply. Ready to unwrap a surprise from Consumer Cellular? Experience the gift of freedom with no contract, no hidden fees, and always free activation. Here comes the holiday surprise. From now till December 31st, new customers can enjoy their second month for free. To get this holiday offer, visit ConsumerCellular.com or call 1-888-FREEDOM and use promo code PODCAST. Act before December 31st to get your second month on us. Use promo code PODCAST. Hello and welcome to a new podcast, The Paddock in the Pavilion with Stephen Wallace. In each show, Stephen will interview someone connected to the world of horse racing or cricket. Hello everyone, a happy new year to you all. On today's podcast, I'm going to be joined by John Berry and Richard Pittman, two racing experts, to discuss the racing year of 2021. Thanks for joining me again, John, from the home of racing. How are you? I'm fine, thank you. We're ending the year in New Market in almost feels like spring. It's warm, but uh, that won't last for long, will it? Now we've got savage winter to get through, but plenty, plenty to look forward to. Well, a happy new year to you. Richard will be popping up during the podcast. I spoke to him earlier today to talk about national hunt racing, but you're going to be talking about flat racing. And to start with, I wanted to ask you, how has the, the year been for you? I know that the, the passing of Roy Rocket hit you hard in April. Yeah, not not a good year for this table, but the good thing is you go first of January, you go back to square one and see what the following year brings. You know, I'm a bit sceptical of believing that the world changes any more from one day becoming the next, whether it's one, you know, it's just another day passing, but you know, it, it's you go back to square one or statistics and then go back to square one and first again. So we'll start the year full of hope. And how, how tough is it training in this sort of COVID environment or have you got used to it? COVID isn't an issue. Um, I mean, it's, it's, I think probably, I was expecting it, COVID to hit racing and businesses within racing harder than it has. And it, it has had an impact probably to a greater or lesser extent to most people. But as regards training the horses, it's, you know, it, it, it's probably second only to farming to being unaffected by it. It's, it's, it's outdoor work that is socially distanced anyway. So even during the most stringent lockdown that the country had in the second quarter of 2020 on a day-to-day basis, we were still going out and keeping busy and getting the work done, which particularly at the time, was something we were all very grateful for because you had to feel very sorry for people who you know, didn't have much much freedom in their days. You didn't have, didn't have, didn't have, you had a lot of time on their hands and not many ways of filling it. My review of the year started with Richard Pittman and his thoughts on Cheltenham and Aintree. He began by giving his insight into Irish trainer Henry de Bromhead, who trained Manila Indo, Honeysuckle and put the kettle on to win the Holy Trinity, the Cheltenham Gold Cup, the Champion Hurdle and the Champion Chase, respectively. Well, quite amazing, but you mustn't forget the pilots, of course. But Henry de Bromhead as a trainer, I mean, I knew his father, Harry, very good trainer, but Henry's taken it on another notch. But the thing about him, he is so humble and not quiet, but he doesn't push himself out there. He deserves all that he gets. He obviously is a very, very good trainer, places his horses well, but it's just the way that he's accepted the mantle of being such a prolific trainer. I think it's superb. It is momentous, but haven't we seen the pendulum swing? Because the the Irish trade was, we used to buy them all, of course, but the, the, the Global owners now are able to keep them in Ireland. And uh, so the big pendulum, I, I mean, I can remember when if, if Ireland won three or two at the festival, they were delighted. You know, I mean, now they're all 
is terrific. They're very difficult to win. Uh, and to, to go and get the three that you've mentioned of Henry's and him not be shouting from the roofs of doing somersaults, I, I think is amazing. He's a quiet little man from the south of Ireland and does his job well. And I think that's what's attracted a lot of these good owners to him. Yeah, 23-5, the, uh, the score was at the 2021 Cheltenham Festival. <laughs> and, and I dare say it might be the same next year. What did you think of Rachel Blackmore's achievement in winning the Grand National on the Manila Times and being the leading jockey at the Cheltenham Festival in 2021? With six winners. I mean, that is incredible. I did a little thing. I'm a great admirer of her. And I did a little thing uh, at Cheltenham for the Jockey Club employees. There were 400 of them there for the day. And so to keep everyone jollied along, we were invited. There was Ruby Walsh, Barry Geraghty, Rachel Blackmore, myself, Ed Chamberlain, Ollie Bell. Um, and we kept the crowd entertained but they didn't know we were there you see and we were all put on the winners podium and they came from behind us from the stands down below and we could hear the buzz of them chatting 400 people you know not a lot on a race day but on a quiet non-racing day the buzz was super and just to hear sound there again and um rachel said of course well it wasn't like that when when I was winning at Chelsea, because there was no one, there was no one here, you see. So when they all stood there and realised that we were there, we were introduced, they clapped, and someone said, "Look, Rachel, now is your chance to go and trot up the winners' enclosure." You see, so she did. She went went to the little gate that lets you in and and trotted up to the people who went mad in the stands. It was just one of those silly, marvelous moments. But she is such. A level-headed, lovely girl rides the most superb tactical races, not on one or two, but on everything. She takes the great line in a race. Um, you know, she never seems to be in the wrong place. And she's light. She's a good, stylish finisher. She's got everything going for her. And it's amazed that it's only just happened in the last few seasons. She's 31 now. But because she's light, I think that we'll have the pleasure of seeing her around for a long time. Now, years ago, when uh, I was riding, when girls, Charlotte Brew was the first one to ride in the National, and girls started riding, and they got a lot of stick because they didn't get the rides. You have to ride regularly in the start of the season, or you did then, to get your breathing right. I mean, now that they have fitness trainers, nutritionists, and the can't even say that, but everything else. So, uh, you know, they are highly toned athletes. And Rachel is as good uh, as anyone. Forget that she's a female. I mean, the thing has gone on so far now, uh, with Bryony, of course. And before then, Nina Carberry and Katie Walsh, very, very good jockeys. Uh, and on the flat, there's stacks of them. But what was marvellous with Rachel Blackmore when she pulled up, because she'd been saying, look, I don't want to be called a female jockey. I'm a jockey. And when she pulled up and, you know, these hot and sweaty interviews where they shove a microphone straight up your nose when you're finished, she said, oh, I don't know if I'm a female, a male, or if I'm human. I thought it was a marvellous. That's pure emotion, you know, marvellous. No, she is good. And at the time, sorry, I digressed, I said for years and years, a girl will win the national before she wins the gold cup. Well, the reason being that you, you could be a horseman and that would count for a lot in the national, whereas you have to be a jockey in the gold cup. And now we have the, the girls that are both, they're horsemen and they're jockeys. Well, she was second in the, in the gold cup last year and, and won the champion hurdle on Honey, Honeysuckle, who... We must have a very good chance of winning the champion hurdle again in 2022. Yes, absolutely. And she could have wit ridden the winner of the Gold Cup. She chose to ride the second, who I think will win the Gold Cup this year. But that's um, just flirting about. Um, no, it's tremendous. And she took it in her stride. And of course, being a lockdown with COVID, all the Irish contingent with the horses were put in the centre of the course on 
what used to be the old cabbage patch and is now a very nice grandstand. So it, it, as the momentum went on, each time they all came out of that stand and cheered her, you know, she crossed the winning line. It, it was great, but a shame for her that she didn't get the adoration that would be accorded normally. I, I'm just in awe of her. It's now time for some flat racing with trainer John Berry. It's the time of the year to look back and uh, I wanted to, to start off with by talking about the trainer of the year, Charlie Appleby. Now, he won virtually everything. He won the Derby, the Irish Derby, the King George, the St. Ledger, the Champion Sprint, the Dewhurst, three big races at the, the Breeders' Cup. What's his major qualities as a trainer? Well, the key to his success is he trains very good horses because he gets to pick a big dolphin string. But the key to his qualities, uh, he's a top-class horseman. He's a very hard worker and he's a very decent person. Um, you know, he just, he does things the right way, whether it's training horses or whether it's going through life as a human being. He's, uh, and he's, a, he's a person of the very, very highest caliber. Well, his two leading horses last year, or this year, were the Derby winner, Adaya, and Hurricane Lane, who won the St. Ledger and also finished third in the Derby. How would you compare those two colts? Very hard to say. I mean, they did, they did meet on the, in the arc on heavy ground. Um, they're, they're the two best. They, they have been two best through the old colts in England in 2021. So... Um, I mean, having the two best three-year-old colts, English trained three-year-old colts, wouldn't necessarily guarantee that you would be champion trainer. But when you throw in the fact that Aidan O'Brien, despite the fact that he won a lot of Group 1 races, had by his standards a quiet year and didn't have particularly good horses, that lit, left the door open for Charlie to be champion trainer. And those were his two flagship horses. But, I mean, the thing was, he had such strength in depth. He actually had a lot of other flagship horses. But they were they were the two best ones. I mean, at Adar, I think if you went to the straw poll of a hundred people, ask which is the better horse, opinions would probably be split 50-50 or close to 50-50. By winning the Derby, Adar has is the more notable. But you know, it's going to be great next year to see what they can what they can go and do. But now two two terrific horses, and you know Charlie is as he's expected very well with both of them yes it will be great to see both of them uh, run as four-year-olds and uh, say winning the derby for newmarket um how much of a boost is it to the town for the the derby winner to come from newmarket because the irish have won seven of the last ten well it isn't really because you sort of forget that charlie's horses are newmarket trained because they don't use the heat so you you you'd never see them exercise you know the the sort of curiosity would be if the horse was exiting trained, would clearly not the horse would clearly not be new market trained, but you'd feel as if that was a new market horse because he'd do all his training on new market heat. I mean, I suppose Charlie's stable is closer to Moulton than to New Market, so you'd almost say Moulton trainer. But um I mean in the race cards it's Charlie Appleby New Market. But no, I mean it's you don't go out you know, you, you go out thinking, oh, there's John Golson, oh, there's Stradivarius as an able. You don't go out in the morning thinking, I wonder if we'll do Derby with today, because that just won't happen because they, 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 they don't use these. So it almost doesn't feel as if it's a new market train horse. But the other way, Charlie is a new market person through and through. His parents live in the town. He came to town, came to town, I don't know, he's probably only about 20 when he's been here. So he's been, been here for more than half his life. And yeah, it was... Uh, Great for, great for him. I mean, it's, 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 I'm really pleased to see Charlie, Charlie playing with Derby, um, even if, as I say, you don't feel it's quite a total new market. I mean, I put it this way, I always like to claim Golden Miller as the new market trained horse because he did his work on the heat, but he was trained in next thing. Um, so, yeah, as I say, I, the Molten Palace horses, it doesn't really feel as if they're trained in new market. But what did you think to... Adam Kirby, a, a, not the most famous jockey, winning a, cl- a classic for the first time and winning the Derby on Adaya. Oh, that was just great. Adam is one of those jockeys that it's impossible not to respect. It's impossible not to like. 
he's so, I mean, I sometimes think if you if you had a five aside team, you'd want Adam on that. He's such a competitor. He's an absolute horseman. He's a first class jockey. He is so professional to keep his weight, keep his keep his weight down for it to be feasible because he's a big man. Um no, I mean I mean Adam's Adam had one ride for us earlier in the year. And he's the type of jockey that, you know, it's a special occasion when he rides a horse for you because you, you appreciate the fact that a jockey that you respect as much as him is riding the horse. Um, you know, I was almost on Derby Day, you know, when Shogar or Golden Horn or whatever, Shogar's won Derby, Golden Horn's won the Derby. But this year it was almost, particularly bearing in mind that going into the race, Adia was a horse that, you know, wasn't a headline horse and he was stable's third spring and, you know, wasn't the horse on your mind. On Derby, the evening of Derby Day, it was Adam Kirby's one Derby. I was absolutely delighted, absolutely delighted to see that. And, you know, he's Adiar's a top class horse and won really well, but Adam gave him an absolutely faultless ride, which in a lot of Derby's recently, not every good horse has received a faultless ride, but Adiar certainly did. But, you know, that's part of the course with Adam Kirby. He's just, he's just a wonderful jockey and, and a thoroughly good human being. Because he had lost his original ride on John Leeper when uh, Frankie de Tory became available. So it was a, a last minute to, chance to, to ride in the derby as well. Yes, that was, that was, rather, that was rather strange. Um, it was rather strange him not riding John Leeper, been riding him, and seemed, it seemed to be the case he was going to. But I suppose one can understand John Leeper's connections, you wanting to use Frankie. Because Frankie, of course, has won some big races on on the Horses Dam, Snow Fairy. Um, but yeah, it certainly wasn't to Adiar's disbenefit that Adam became available and got the ride. And I think actually there was going to be something was Ashin Murphy's good often often used him, and I think they would have used him, but I couldn't work out exactly what it sort of he might, I think it just, it was just one of those incidents. The ride arrangement for Adiar reflected so well on everyone, everyone involved. And it was, you know, it's nice to see good behaviour being rewarded with victory. Well, keeping on the Charlie Appleby theme, as you said, he, he didn't just have those two horses. He also had many of the leading two-year-olds. Uh, his horse, Native Trail, won the Dewhurst. Modern Games won in, in the Breeders, at the Breeders' Cup. Uh, Carabas won a Group 3 at Newmarket. And there's also um, one of his main rivals will be, as a three-year-old, probably Luxembourg, who won the Futurity at um, at Doncaster. How do you sum up the two-year-old season? I thought the Native Trail was easily the most impressive horse. It is, if two-year-old form translates to three-year-old form, which, of course, it doesn't usually because some horses improve abnormally. Some horses make normal improvement, and some horses are already starting to show signs of wear and tear and don't really progress. But Native Trail was easily the best two year old, and I think there's a strong chance of him being the best three year old. He's with a very good trainer, but hopefully, should ensure that he does continue to progress. Caribus was an impressive horse. You know, Luxembourg's an obviously Derby horse, but you know, if you if you were to nominate one, one of them as a a very good year as a three-year-old. It's no brainer to pay any price. Now, on top of Appleby stars, I mean, you said that uh, Aidan O'Brien didn't have a ha- have as good a season as he has in the past, but he still trained St. Mark's Basilica, who won the the French Two Thousand Guineas, the French Derby, the Eclipse, the Irish Champion Stakes. We also had Mishrif for John and Thady Gosden, who easily won the Jodmont International, and then we had the Milers Poetic Flair. Bayed and Palace Pier, who do you consider the best horse of 2021? And of course, we've got Adayor and Hurricane Lane as well. So Mark Baselica, you have to respect. Mishrif, when he won in uh, Saudi Arabia, Dubai and Judmont and the Judmont at York, was very good. Poetic flair on firm ground was an outstanding three-year-old miler. He was probably just unfortunate he didn't meet firm ground as often as he would have liked to have done as 
uh, what certainly his connections would like him to have done. But poetic flair was unbelievably good on firm ground. But for me, there's only one horse could have been horse of the year, and that had a you, you know, the Derby is our biggest race. The King George is our biggest weight for age race. To, not just to win them both, but to win them both utterly decisively. You know, you, you, you'd like your horse of the year to have won another race over and above them, but he, he won the two most important races very, very impressively. So, yes, I mean, to me, Adrian. And even for saying he's not necessarily the best three year old in the stable, but it's almost toss a coin between him and Hurricane Lane. But yeah, Adrian. Would, I didn't know hesitation in nominating Adrian. We also had a uh, titanic struggle in the Jockeys' Championship between Osin Murphy and William Buick. Uh, Osin Murphy finishing on 153 wins, William Buick 151. That must have been good for racing as well. It was, yes. It was. Um, both jockeys came out of that with great credit because it's it's tough. They've been. You know, it's. I mean, it's probably easier than you know. You know, there were times in the early 90s when Frankie Dottori and Jason Weaver were dueling for the title and it ran up to 31st of December and, you know, and then you know, it should still be running up to November handicap date. It's actually finishing three weeks earlier than it should do and it's a much shorter season. Illogically, it isn't starting till 2000 guineas day. So it, it, it's, it's, it's a much shorter season to focus on, but it's still when from quite a long way before the end of the season, if they're engaged in a day-to-day tussle to be champion jockey, and both jockeys are you know, going the extra mile to try and do it, it's a gruelling, punishing schedule, and both jockeys cope with it very well. Um, you know, and, and emerge, emerge with great credit. One of those cases you'd almost like to have seen a dead heat for the title. I mean, I, I was actually barricading for William so the only deciding factor in my mind being that he'd never been champion jockey before and Ashin had. And they they both they both deserve to have champion jockey next next to next to their name. William of course still doesn't have it. So hopefully hopefully his turn will come in twenty twenty two and I'd like to see that. I mean of course well, was the one and yeah, I mean it's it's great interest for racing, great it's it's, a, it's another positive racing story. It you know too many negative racing stories in the in the year. A positive racing story is two top class jockeys playing the game hard and fair, going to Wolverhampton on the Monday, Bright Bath on the Tuesday to ride, you know, class five, class six horses for a wide variety of trainers, giving everything every race. Um, no, it was it was it was it was, it was a great, great story. I mean, it, it was up to, in theory, it was up to the last day, but it would have been. I think William started the last day three behind. And he had one win. He realistically, he wasn't going to ride three or four winners on the last day. But you know, even the even the stuff the second last day, he was it was still not inconceivable that he William could have ended up champion jockey. I mean, of course, the irony was I think it was just an ultimate Monday of the season. He had was it four horses were drawn at the start, or three or four horses were drawn at the start at Wolverhampton, and possibly all of which were favourite. Two were drawn by the bet, one bolted to post. I think it's three. But, you know, it was a real, it was definitely a five-act play, and I really enjoyed following it. Of course, the one unsatisfactory aspect is we now know that because of VHA not following protocol, Ashin shouldn't have been champion jockey because um, they'd, it was a breath test thing at Chester May meeting, and which was put to one side and not, one of the never going to be dealt with. Yeah, he's a suspension which he ought to have been given that he wasn't given. And I think mean, what well, he's entitled to scratch his head a little bit about that. But but no, I mean I don't want to take away the achievement from Rashin. He's a terrific jockey. And he he's a well I, I they are both terrific jockeys and either of them would have been a world champion. Well let's hope uh, we get a similar race again next next year and uh, that Osin is back to tip-top health in 2022. Yes, I mean, I'm guessing he probably won't be riding the first part of the, first, first part of the season. I mean, he's surrendered his licence. I, I don't really understand it because for the alcohol offences and it transpires a COVID protocol, I mean, they all carry suspensions. 
he can't serve the suspension while he's unlicensed. I don't really understand him surrendering his license. I just thought he'd be better off maintaining a license and serving suspensions now when he doesn't want to ride anyway. Um, but yeah, I mean, he'll be back. He'll be. I mean, he he's a he's a very intelligent and basically very grounded human being that will make sure he doesn't repeat his mistakes. I mean, when you're speaking to Richard Pittman, I remember one of Richard's. Quote, one of his great Fred Winter quotes, for Fred Winter the same thing. I don't, I don't find any mistake you make as long as you never make the same mistake twice. And he made sure that he didn't. I'm sure Richard will tell you about that if you ask him. But Ashin isn't going to make the same mistake twice. He, he'll be back, no question about it. But my feeling is he probably won't be back at the very start of the season. Because um, I, I just don't quite understand how this, whether, when the suspensions are going to be served because he's not licensed at the moment. But, I mean, I actually wouldn't, I'd be quite happy not to see a tussle for the jockey's title next year. I'd be quite happy to see William Buick an easy winner because he, he, he deserves to be champion jockey. And I, I'd, li- I'd, like to, I'd like to see him. <laughs> I certainly wouldn't begrudge him getting it in a less stress-free way in 2022. One trainer who recently announced his retirement was David Ellsworth, regarded as one of the greatest dual-purpose trainers. David trained in the groove to win the Irish 1000 guineas, Persian Punch to win the Goodwood and Doncaster Cups, Ryman Reason to win the Grand National in 1988, and of course, Desi. Richard gave this tribute to David Ellsworth. I rated David Ellsworth before he trained. I rode with him. I rated him as a jockey, a very canny jockey. And he started his training experience as assistant to someone called Ricky Valance down near Devizes. And it was generally thought that David was training the horses, and he probably was at that stage. And one of them was a horse called Red Candle. I think he won the Hennessy. Uh, he was either second to Red Rum or beat Red Rum down there. But, it, it, but David was training them. And then he got his first premises not far away on the edge of Salisbury Plain and it was a a converted piggery small but had about six or eight boxes and I went down and because I knew Elsie well then and, and wanted to see what he was up to I think I probably did an article in the horse and hound in those days on him but he was always a thinker clever man he let his horses do the talking uh, and of course, for him to then move on from this little piggery to Whitsbury, what a marvellous place to train and to do what he did, not just Desi, Persian Punch, the Sprinters. Uh, oh, you know, it was there was so many. He could do anything. I think I think he's been underrated, even though he's been lauded. I still think he's been underrated because of the diversity of horse that he's been able to produce is tremendous but that period with Desi was just magical everyone loved Desi and he stood back didn't he from the limelight little Janice Coyle who used to look after him got a lot of the limelight and so did Richard Burridge the owner um, but but Elsie just stood back a little bit he he's very good yes talking of, of Desi we mustn't forget the 1989 Cheltenham Gold Cup and Watching it again on, on, on YouTube, you hear Peter O'Sullivan say he's beginning to get up. You must have been there that momentous day. <laughs> yes, I've heard Peter um, say a lot of similar things. He said it when Dawn Run was going to get up. She was headed and came back and, oh, the man's going to get up. It was the same with Desi. And the, the reason it was so momentous, though, is, Stephen, that He wasn't a Cheltenham horse. He wasn't a left-handed horse. The ground was bottomless. He wanted better ground. So he has won the big prize, even though he'd had four King Georges and many, many others. The Cheltenham Gold Cup just does stand alone a bit. And to do it in adverse conditions, I know he only beat Yahoo, but you can only beat the opposition that's there. So he did it. And Simon Sherwood, who we all used to call Sharky, Sharky Sherwood on board. It it meant a lot to him and a lot to his followers. They just loved him because front running, bold jumping, grey horse, gave his heart every time he went out. What more can you ask? And also the longevity 
of these steeplechasers, as opposed to the flat, most occasions, we we live with them for eight, nine, ten years. Let's get back to John and go international to talk about the Pre de l'Arc de Triomphe, the Melbourne Cup, and the leading sire of 2021, the mighty Frankel. Well, moving on to the Arc Pre de l'Arc de Triomphe, um, you mentioned that earlier, and we had a surprise 80 to 1 winner with. Tocato Tasso winning for Germany. What was your thoughts on the race, the going? We had all this discussion about whether it should be the date should be changed. Yeah, I, I don't understand I, why. Should, I didn't. I, why should the date be changed? I didn't really understand that. Yeah, I mean, it, it's going to be run on going whenever it is, whether it's fast going, soft going. I mean, there's been track records broken in arcs. <laughs> you know, we're in we're in Europe. It can rain any day of the year. I mean, the arc, the arc, the arc is the first Sunday of October, and I, I haven't seen a sensible reason put forward for its date being changed. The first Sunday in October works, um, and uh, yeah, if it's run on firm ground or heavy ground, I actually don't see that it matters. It's just run on track, just run on turf. You know, if you, you might say, well, if you don't want it to be heavy ground. So because it was heavy ground this year and last year and the year before, don't run it then. But don't run it in the third week of June because it was heavy ground at Alaska. Don't run it in the last week of July, first week of August, because it was heavy ground in Glorious Goodwood. No, I mean, it's, 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 it's a nonsense. And, you know, if it's, uh, if it's to identify the best horse, you know, a chick, a chink, in a, a chink in a horse's armour is that he can't handle certain types of ground. So, you know, if, if you're wanting to identify it, one by a great... That's the same, Poetic Blau was a terrific horse on firm ground, but, you know, he wasn't so good, he wasn't so good on soft. If we're, if we're wanting to find an all-time if we want to find an all great, the way to go about it isn't before we've even started, started identifying the races to say, oh, well, he can't go on this ground, he can't go on that ground. No, 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 the, the arc's a fantastic place and there's no... Uh, there is there is no such thing as a good reason to change the date. It's three weeks after our trials. So, I mean, if you moved it forward, you'd be, you know, it'd be too close to Irish champion stakes, and you know, you'd have to move, you know, all the races that horses might run in it beforehand. The Gross Price Bombard and St. Edger, Green Neil, the Pre Four, you'd have to move all then. It wouldn't make any sense at all. Well, keeping on the international flavour, we're just going to move down to. Australia, a race I know that you love, the, the Melbourne Cup. Uh, you tipped tip me the winner last year with Twilight Payment. What did you think to the new guidelines that were introduced, both pre-export checks and pre-race checks for the race in 2021? Well, they had to be. They were getting the European horses were doing too much harm to the races, uh, popularity by too many of them sustaining serious and sometimes fatal injuries they, 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 they had to do more stringent soundness check for imports and uh, no they, they, they had to be done I mean the unintended consequences I mean it wasn't I think I doubt this was an intended consequence but the unintended consequence was that the race went back to what it was before and it, you know a really exciting exciting race for the best courses in Australia. And I, I find the Melbourne Cup much more exciting this year. You know, it, it, was, it, was, it was a really, really good race at the absolute top-class horses finished first and second, um, which is what it should be. You know, because the thing is, Twilight Payment is not a top-class horse. I, I, for me, the race had become, had become much less excited when it was flooded by European Group 3 standard horses. You know, very elegant and incentivized. The two terrific horses on the boat. Very elegant running, incentivized to running. You know, wherever they're running, it's a big occasion. But you know, Twilight Payment could be running in a listed race at Dan Royal, and you wouldn't plan your day around making sure you don't miss Twilight Payments. Um, and you know, Mar- Marmello was favourite in the World Cup again. You know, he he wasn't. He, he, he's not. He's not. He's not. He's not, he's not had AR. You're not thinking good. He's running it. You know, it, it, for me, for me, the Melbourne Cup has become a much less interesting race for having so many Europeans in it. I think it's been a very good change. And 
you know, you, you can, European horses can still go. It makes it hard, harder to go, harder to go. There's more red tape, etc. cetera. Uh, well, not just red tape, more things to do. But, you know, Andrew Balding had a runner, um, finished third. Get a, a, a grand horse had finished third, Yorkshire Cup and Doncaster Cup winner finished third, Andrew Balding and, um, you know, Joseph O'Brien sending out the horse to win the cox plate it's it's still feasible but uh no no i i, I so you certainly won't find me complaining about it and as i say they had they had to make the changes because they they couldn't they couldn't go on having horses coming out from the northern hemisphere and uh, get getting getting face injured that's just totally unacceptable yes as you said andrew bolden sent spanish mission who came third and was had been third in the ascot gold cup the winner very elegant has, has had many battles against uh, Adaib. Yes, yes, it's it's just such a pity Adaib won't be going up for the Sydney Orphan Carnival this year. I think he's had a setback and can't go. But no, I mean she will we in Europe we were very familiar with her and with her fall line through Adaib. No, she's it would be you know she she she'd hold her own and wait for age races of a mile and a quarter, mile and a half, two miles clearly of the Northern Cup shown in in, in Europe, it would be lovely to, lovely to see a race there. And the runner-up incentivised was, uh, you know, he was going in the right seven consecutive wins with me. A couple of just easy last start, Group 1 winner. One couple of Group 1 weight race races, easy going through it. Um, yeah, it, it, was, it was a much better... And the you know, Spanish mission is one of the better credentialed European horses that's gone for a long... You know, to, to get a horse that's... Won a Doncaster Cup, won a Yorkshire Cup, been third in the Nascot Gold Cup. You know, he's a proper top level European stayer. No, I, I think it was the highest quality trifecta the race has had for a long time. It's, go, it's going back to the, you know, to the Bart Cummings, Tommy Smith era, and you had to be, you know, you had, you, you had to be one of the very best horses around to keep in the Northern Cup. Well, one horse that um, did go on all going, well, certainly won his, his last race in. Very soft going at, at Ascot was Frankel, the horse of the year in 2010, 11 and 12. What impact is, is he having on the breed as a stallion? Well, he's turned, he's turned out to be nearly as dominant a stallion as he was a racehorse. He's, you know, he was supreme as a racehorse and he's never going to be as far ahead of his competitors as a stallion as he was as a racehorse. And he's never going to star a horse as good as himself was because you know horses as good as Frankel have only come along every few centuries. But he's the heir apparent to Galileo, which you know Galileo died this year, but he's obviously still got full re- racing representation and will have for a handful of years. He'd been Galileo had won the size title in twelve of the last thirteen years. And I think 11 years on the trot, we just assumed he'd keep winning it. And Frankel has taken it off him by a wide margin. Frankel is farther clear of Galileo, more than a million and a half clear of Galileo. And Galileo is off the bar we see the stars and dark angel next to the next, the next three on the table. And that's despite the fact that the Frankel ends up around the world, Australia, Japan. And I think only about half the Group grade one victories of Frankel stock in the air actually counted towards British and Irish size, size championship. But it obviously helped that he had the two best three year old Colts, i.e., certainly the two best three year old Colts in England, certainly two best mile and a half three year old Colts in England, mile and a half for the best prize money is, i.e., Addy Iron Hurricane Lane. You know, I, I wouldn't want to go down the road of saying, they are better or worse than to Mark Vasilek as it is a, a cracking horse. But A, he, he wasn't trained in England, and B, he's uh, he, he does, he, he's never tried it a mile and a half, which is obviously you know the supreme distance and the distance at which the most valuable race in the hell. You know. Well, saying that, the champion stakes is no more valuable than the derby, which is weird. But the most valuable race in Europe, the arc, is a mile and a half. And for until the last couple of years, you know, basically throughout history, the most valuable race in England has been the Derby. And 
that's a mile and a half. So, but I mean, Tranquil doesn't just get mile and a half horses. He gets horses across the distance range. He gets some very fast horses. He gets top. He gets top class two year olds, staying horses, mining. He's just, he's just a complete stallion. He's he appears to be the heir apparent to Galileo, um, and that's as high a praise as you can give us. Our and it's been it's been it was you know horse as good and as good looking as. Frank Holt should turn out to be a high class star. And he was given top class mares from the start. But even so, you almost hardly dare believe that he could be. You know, it's uh, in one set, you know, you're almost thinking, can, can lightning strike twice? Can you be, can the best race or become the best stallion? But, you know, logically, that's what should happen. And it doesn't always happen, but it, it's happened in this case. And he's a one that we, we can now say he's a wonderful stallion, well, a wonderful race horse, which is. Which is it gives me a lot of pleasure to know that. I think it gives everyone who admires and loves Frank a lot of pleasure to know that. But. The final highlight of the 2021 racing year was the King George VI chase at Kempton, won by the 28 to 1 outsider Tornado Flyer. Here's Richard's summary of the showpiece race. You must never leave a Willie Mullins horse out. He wasn't the obvious one, that's why he went off at 28 to 1. But what played into his hands was the way that Frodon and Milena Indo took each other on. The early fractions, I think, made what is an easy track into a stamina track. And he certainly played into his part at the end and won very well under Danny Munnins, who's flying, having a great time, and Willie Mullins. I, I, I don't think they went there with pretensions of winning, but they certainly are able to produce them out of the hat. They're not all odds on favourites, the Mullins winners. It, it was an amazingly fast run race, and I'm sure that Frodo and Manila Indo did cut each other's throats because they both capitulated so quickly. Now, my opinion of various horses, a five furlong horse will stay three miles if the pace is steady. But if they're sprinting, they only go five furlongs. Then they they blow up. You know, you can only do go fast for so long. And that's why fractions are so important when you you especially if you're a front runner, the fractions are what decides the outcome. Two major racing people who passed away in 2021 were Khalid Abdullah uh, of Judmont and Hamdan Al Maktoum of Shadwell. Could you sum up their influence as owners and breeders uh, for racing and for new market? Yeah, so I mean, I think we, we'd, we'd throw in Mr. Thompson, the principal of Cheveley Park Stud. Fortunately, Cheveley Park Stud, Mrs. Thompson, is you know equally enthusiastic, so that seems to be continuing more or less as was. But there are three operations which have Bred and raced an awful lot of good horses, brought a lot of enjoyment uh, to race goers, created a lot, a lot of jobs. And, you know, they've all, all three, you never heard of a Shadwell horse or a Judmont horse or a Chibli Park horse. You know, you never heard them in run, running and riding inquiries. You never heard, there was never a whiff of scandal in any of the operations they're all just done on the way on the way it should be done and nice thing is judgment appears to be carrying on largely as it was but you know that's probably easy in the short term as Tranquil and kingman will be bringing in massive revenues so you know it's a lot easier to, easier for the ads to say let the business continue when the business is either breaking even or making a profit uh which Shadwell wouldn't have been. Shadwell is already less than you know, and a few months after Jake Hammer passing is already been massively reduced, which is all which is a real shame. But yes, yeah, it's safe in the new market. I mean, cheaper parts in the new market. Well, for a long time they seem to have all their horses trained in new market, but they've got some up in Yorkshire now. But they they've been a great supporter of new market. You could walk from new market east to Chiefly Park Stud. You could walk from new market east to Banstead Manor Stud. Takes slightly longer. And even Shadwell, you know, the main start up in up in Norfolk, then, thirty-five miles away. Yeah, they, they, they've been a great boon for racing in general and, and for this this area in particular. And uh, you know, 
three, 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 three great sportsmen. And, you know, there's very much people die every day. And if you don't know them, you don't know them. And I'm always mindful of the Russian proverb. If you live next to the churchyard, you can't, you can't die at every funeral. You know, metaphorically, we do all live next to the churchyard. But there are three people that made such a, you know, you get people that are so significant in life in general that you feel that you knew them. You feel that they were a big part of your life, even though you didn't, you didn't know them at all. And all three of those people would be in the same in in the same category. I think I think every race enthusiast felt felt that Sheikh Hamdan, Prince Khalid Abdullah, and Mr. Thompson had done a lot to you know in benefit and improve their their enjoyment of racing. And I, I think I think I think I think all racing enthusiasts felt felt that felt that part felt that part. And even though you know the vast majority of us have never met never met any of them. Well, thank you, uh, John, for those kind words there. Um, three very significant people in in horse racing. Uh, thank you for joining me to review the, the racing year of 2021. And best wishes to you and to your stable for 2022. Thank you very much. That's a, as I say, 1st of January, all the clocks are turned back to zero. Hope springs eternal in the human breath. Thank you very much. Thanks again to Richard Pittman for his National Hunt Insight into the racing year of 2021. Richard and John will be back for a short podcast in the next few days to talk about their favourite moment of 2021 and a horse to follow for 2022. Thank you for listening to The Paddock and the Pavilion. You can download the show on Apple Podcasts, SoundCloud, Stitcher and Spotify. Follow us on Twitter and Facebook at The Pad and Pad. Sports Social Podcast Network. Make this Christmas memorable with Goat Guns. Get the coolest miniature gun models for your collection. From historical classics to modern weapons, we have something for every firearm and hobby enthusiast. Surprise your loved ones with the gift of Goat Guns. The perfect blend of quality and detail. Shop now and spread the joy at GoatGuns.com.